Well, I did it. I finally saved up enough money to do what I said I was going to do. I got an HTC Vive. At Christmas, it was finally mine. Even though I paid for most of it, but it was the most incredible feeling. Setting it up was really cool too. I had to enlist the help of my brother and dad because I had my chest cut open about a week and a half prior. <laughs> Can you find your nose, Ross? But the best part about this whole thing is that I was right. VR is the future of where video games are going to go. I can tell from how much of a different kind of experience this is, and hell, Valve seems to think so too. They said they weren't going to make Half-Life 3 unless they could change the industry like they did with the last game, and here we are. Whether or not it'll do its job is still up in the air, and I'll tell you what I think of its chances in a minute, but right now, I want to tell you about the game that had me so excited all the way at the beginning of last year. Brandon Lotch is the most I could dig up when it comes to trying to find information on Stress Level Zero, the developers of this title. The man co-operated a YouTube channel with a dude named Freddy Wong. Lotch has made a few VR games under the umbrella of Stress Level Zero, but none have received the attention and seemingly as much care from the team as Boneworks. This game was being shown off everywhere thanks to Brandon's YouTube connections and received millions of eyes and watchers before it was even released. And that's certainly how I saw it. Given time, the game would be released and break records, being the fastest selling VR game to date and reaching Steam's top selling VR charts of 2019 even though it was released on the 10th of December. That means it outpaced every single VR game of the entirety of 2019 in less than 21 days. That's insane. But if we're being fair, the game deserves it all. It's absolutely breathtaking. I know I'm kind of skipping the whole video here, but I adored my time with this game. If this is when VR really starts kicking itself into high gear, I'm so glad I got in at the right time. I guess visually, it's nothing to write home about. It conveys what it needs to, but it's not winning awards for visual design. The story was a little too much on the open to interpretation side for my liking, and I didn't feel like digging through fan theories to try and get something from it. It was enough to service the gameplay. And thankfully, this game is at its best when it's being a game. When you boot it up, you realize that you have arms in the game. You actually have a full body, but your arms are what you use the most. You can individually manipulate different fingers to grab and interact with objects in the world. With this in mind, you're required to solve sometimes small, sometimes large puzzles. And given how this is a physics sandbox game, you might not even be completing the puzzle how you're supposed to, but that's okay. That's the beauty of it. I remember that I was stuck on this puzzle for days because I kept trying to do it in a specific way. And then one night, my brother and dad came in to play with me and we all came up with this new way to beat it and it totally worked and we literally cheered. It was amazing. The puzzles are a great piece of this game, but the funny thing is, after you leave one of the earlier levels that's jam-packed with them, you don't really find too many brain scratchers from then on. I think that comes down to poor pacing, but also poor level placement. So Streets, the Giga level, is the third in the game. And the ones before it are essentially tutorial levels. So you get hit with the biggest marathon of a level the game has to offer out of the gate. And again, it's also the most loaded down with puzzles. Puzzles that the player has never seen before. Contextually, the level makes sense within its timing in the narrative, but mechanically, the player has no idea how this game truly works yet. And puzzles usually take a lot of time and consideration before you can find the Eureka moment. But on a subsequent playthrough, you can certainly just immediately apply the solution and get through the level much faster. But that first go will make the level feel like a bit of a struggle to get through initially. Not helping the matter, this game works on old school rules. There are no save points or checkpoints in the levels. You have to make it to the end in one go or start from the beginning again when you come back. That's why if you're like me and my family and get motion sickness easily, you'll have to swap off in these kinds of longer levels 
so you don't throw up in your headset. The later levels are much more focused on action, which I honestly prefer, but I do like the little bits of variety here and there. There are even some levels that seem to try completely new genres. There's a dark and slow paced level in a sewer, and at one point you become a prisoner in a dungeon, then break out and fight in a gladiator ring for your freedom, and then do whatever this was. I want to be Dirty Dad! I'm Dirty Dad! I'm Dirty Dad! I'm Dirty Dad! And the levels don't overstay their welcome further into the game. Streets does have its unique moments and opportunities to go ham on some fools, but its initial length made me consistently get queasy around the one-third mark. After learning how to complete all the puzzles and closing my eyes during those long drops, you can comfortably make it from one end to the other in about 40 minutes to an hour. But the later levels are much more bite-sized and approachable. That is, of course, after you've mastered the combat. In Boneworks, there are numerous kinds of weapons to find and defend yourself with. But, seeing as how you have to physically aim down your sights, physically go mano a mano, physically assess your situation, and physically make sure your guns are loaded, it makes it much more involving than anything you've ever played. There's nothing particularly special about the way you take down enemies with a gun or a sword. It plays out exactly how you think it would. But the moment you put on that headset and you're walking around exploring these environments, you are the one in danger. You are fighting for your life and you just get it. It's like a switch flips and you say, Damn, there's the flavor. There's no way I could explain it to you that would do it justice. It's just incredible. I usually love dissecting the combat in games, but there isn't too much here that you haven't done with a controller before. But the lack of a gamepad makes it unlike anything you've ever played. It's an extremely special experience in the context of itself, even if it's not as interesting from a surface level. Even so, there are some cool mechanics unique to this game. Certain important items labeled as hero objects can be force pulled towards you if you're within range. You can actually use this to have an infinite amount of throwing knives if you can keep track. You can get yourself out of a bind if you drop your gun, and even just have a little bit of a power fantasy. And seeing as how your ammunition also works as currency for these weapon vending machines at the beginning of levels, you're almost never out of reach of your favorite toys. And you can really play however you want. The most fun I had in this game was when I came across a knife room in a level and ditched most of my guns and went on an American Psycho rampage. It was so much fun and I probably was grinning like an absolute madman. There is a mechanic that allows you to save yourself from a game over. When you take enough damage, your character will go, I think I'm dying. but if you can manage to get a kill before you completely black out, you can save yourself. It's pretty neat if a little simple. You can't defeat a bad bitch. You just cannot do that. The enemies that only use melee don't really pose much of a threat, honestly. If you have a weapon and you keep your cool, you more than likely won't be overwhelmed. But when you have to fight the ranged enemies like security bots and electro dudes, you have to be careful. Again, this footage doesn't do it justice. However, when you're not ripping the enemies a new one, the level design and layouts are begging you to check every little hidey hole you come across. There are alternate routes to find in some levels, hidden boneworks, boxes that have treasures in them, secrets that you can find to unlock special modes and goodies in the main menu, and much more probably. This game is such an untapped gold mine of secrets and hidden stuff since it's so new and no one knows probably half the hidden stuff within the levels yet. I've even come across some objects that are more off the beaten path and seem to have lower resolution textures, but I've been curious if that was intentional because what if it's like you're getting further and further away from the simulation of the game's story? Or is it intentional for the game's performance sake? I don't know, and that's one of those reasons I find it to be so engaging. It has an insane level of detail and care put into the amount of times you can go through the world in different ways every single time. But if I'm being totally honest, the game is riddled with bugs, and these are definitely not intentional. Mostly with the collision detection. It's really easy for your hands to get stuck inside things you don't want them to. You can be in the heat of a gunfight and all of a sudden, you're in a totally different kind of battle. But this one is with the game's physics. I absolutely hated climbing ladders and other things because sometimes your hands would just freak out and get stuck and push you off. 
and it's worse when the ladder is unreasonably long like in the final level. And if you get thrown off, it kills any of the tension that came before it. And I was beyond frustrated with this slippery section where you have to work yourself along the wall to grab the ladder. Because again, your body will get stuck and then freak out, pushing you away from the ladder and forcing you to make that climb all over again. There was a part when my older brother was playing and just straight up fell through the floor and we had to reset the level. Thankfully we weren't too far into the level, but these were just moments that make you want to stop playing for a little while. The sandbox has a limitless number of ways for you to go about things, but you have to be careful as to not break the game before you get to the solution. It's similar to Sonic Adventure in the ways I will probably find great pleasure in mastering this game's mechanics and having fun with it, but also learning how to avoid breaking the shaky foundation it was built on. But even though that's a big one, I don't think that's the biggest hurdle to jump over if you're looking to try this game out for yourself. VR's price point is a very steep entry fee that, as a phone works, I can safely say was worth it for me, but you might not think so. I would recommend getting this technology as soon as you can, but a few games may not make you feel the same way. Because while yes this technology is amazing and it's incredible to be a part of it now, a lot of this is kind of one note. Many of the games offer merely showcases of things rather than fully fledged games. It's amazing for the social aspect of things, Pavlov in particular is an amazing time to just go goof around and make some friends in, or have a great time with your group. And it makes for the best entertainment at get together since Mario Party. But if you're looking at this and hoping to play through the next AAA action game, I think you're just a year or two too early. I hate to say that, but it's just not realistically profitable for studios to pour all of their resources into a VR game when consoles are still dominating the market. Hopefully in the near future it will become more widely accessible from a monetary standpoint and also more wanted from a development standpoint. We're almost done here so I won't keep you for much longer, but real quick, some advice. Once you beat the game and get fed up and look up how to unlock the sandbox mode, it might be tempting to do what everyone else does and download a save file with all the weapons and enemies already unlocked, but don't do that. Hunting down boxes and all the special enemies and weapons is so much fun. The process of looking for those Boneworks boxes and then trying to hold on to the treasures until the end of the level has given me this feeling that I haven't felt since I was hunting for the skulls with my big brother in Halo 3. Boneworks is so amazingly impressive and absolutely the next evolution in games like this. The constantly unique back and forth you'll have with the enemies will likely never get old. And thanks to a level select, arena, and sandbox mode, I can replay the levels and instances I want to play at any time. And even if it has a few technical issues here and there, the game shines. And it shines bigger and brighter than anything you've ever seen before. I think this is the start of the next big thing for video games. And I'm sure Half-Life Alex will be the next stepping stone. And I'm so excited that I get to be here for it. But how do you feel about VR at this stage? Does the lack of real long-form gaming experiences keep the vibe in your Amazon wishlist for now? Let me know in the comments below. And real double quick, I've been playing some Pavlov and getting into some shenanigans and I'll be putting them on the Let's Play channel. Feel free to check them out if you like loud internet goofiness. But anyway, I appreciate you for watching. So thanks for stopping by and have a great day.